step into their shoes and see if you can think from their perspective because that's gonna be the first step to building bridges with Gen Z and being able to connect with us at work. Hi, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Women Worldwide. Thank you so much for tuning in and for being here. I hope you're all safe and healthy as we're navigating more of COVID and now this Delta variant. Well, here's another week and a great guest with lots of advice to share with you. So I want to get right to the topic and the introduction. Today, we're talking about working with Gen Z. That's right. Every generation is different. And we have to know how to inspire them. How does a company attract and then retain Generation Z? Well, my special guest today certainly has a lot to share on this topic. Joining me on the show is Hannah Williams. And Hannah has an interesting story. She actually got an unexpected introduction to entrepreneurship at the age of 12. When she was 14, she started college. And at age 18, she graduated with a degree in international business. And now she's working with different companies, both startup all the way up to Fortune 500s, on how they can work with Gen Z, helping leaders to leverage Gen Z talent so that it's a competitive advantage. So I could go on and on about Hannah, but I think it's time that she shares her story and advice with you. Hannah, welcome. Welcome to Women Worldwide. Thank you, Deirdre. I'm grateful to be here and it's a beautiful day to be in the studio since it's raining outside. Yes, that's right. In the studio, on Zoom. We're doing a lot of Zooming <laughs> today. Yes, we Microsoft are. Teams, <laughs> if you're working with corporations. Well, it's great to have you here. And I know there's a lot that we can talk about, but I always like to ask that first question. So you can just share a little bit about your journey and this unexpected int introduction to entrepreneurship at such an early age. Absolutely. And as you alluded to, Deirdre, my introduction to business and the world of entrepreneurship really began, I can think about this pinnacle moment when I was 12 years old. So as the story goes, and as I remember it, I'm sitting in the back of my dad's blue pickup truck and we're bouncing down the highway. My dad had been an investor in real estate for as long as I can remember since I was three or four years old. We're bouncing down the highway. I'm a studious student. I'm the oldest of seven children. So I'm trying to get my homework done in the back seat. Well, dad had this brilliant idea of taking his kids to work with him one day a week. He wanted to introduce us to the world of business. I he is a very, it. yes, I, well, I did too. I didn't, I look back now and I'm grateful, but then I didn't love it. <laughs> so, of course. <laughs> was a 12-year-old, and again, sitting in the back of his pickup truck, and we're on the way to collect rents from tenants because that's what you did back then, right? You know, you, you went door to door and collected rents from tenants. So I'm sitting in the back of the truck, minding my own business, and out of the blue, he hands me his cell phone, and he says, hey, Hannah, phone's ringing. There's a guy at the end of the line who wants to sell his house, and you're going to close the deal. And you can imagine, I'm 12 years old, so I'm freaked out of my mind. Right. What What are you doing, Dad? You know, you, you have no clue what you're doing. I'm just going to mess this all up. But I trusted him. So I took the phone. I fumbled through this call. And with his help, we had this property under contract within a few days. And we closed on it a few weeks later. And what's interesting is my parents still own this duplex. So I can see, you know, back from age 12, the journey that I've taken uh, since he introduced me to business. And what really happened after that, as you alluded to with, with that kind introduction, is that I was just fascinated. You know, after I'd actually seen the fruit of what being scared and taking a bit of courage and a leap could do, I became fascinated with just the world of business and what could be accomplished. So I started just absorbing as many business books as I could get my hands on and ended up 
enrolling in college very early so I could get out, get it out of the way and do my own thing. What I ended up doing though, at 18, as soon as I graduated is I ended up entering corporate America. So I spent five years in corporate America, getting to really understand, you know, what are leaders struggling with? What are the key questions that they're asking? But you found out a lot. (laughs) Oh, I did. I did. I did. I was shocked. So what I did through those five years is I found myself, I started in a, in the training and development side of a wonderful company here in my hometown of Asheville, North Carolina. And then I ended up moving into their consulting division. So I got to travel all over the country, working with leaders on their employee and client experiences. And what would inevitably happen, Deirdre, and this is how I got into what I'm doing today, is what what would inevitably happen is at the end of a long day of training, you know, we're exhausted. I've, I've been one of the trainers. So what happens when everyone's exhausted? Well, you go to the bar. Well, here I am at age 18, sitting around the bar with a bunch of Xer and Boomer leaders, and I've got my little sparkling water because I can't drink. <laughs> and I am sitting there with these leaders, and inevitably, the question always came up of, what is wrong with you millennials? That's the question I got all the time. And they would ask, you know, why, why can't I retain you? Why can't I recruit you? Why do you want to be VP next week? And I found myself thinking... I don't really resonate with this conversation. I don't know. I don't see the same thing happening with my peers as when I look at, you know, folks who get those stereotypes, which as you and I both well know are unfortunate stereotypes of millennials, but that stereotype began to carry over into what I then realized was Gen Z, even though, even though I didn't really know at the time why my generation or why I had such a different perspective. So through the past five years, I have spent time researching, speaking with hundreds of leaders and Zers across the globe, actually. And from those conclusions, I have been able to consult firms, but then also I just released a, my first book, um, oh, which congratulations. is, thank you. So, so many of those leaders were asking me these questions. I thought, what better way to do it than synthesize everything into this comprehensive guide about how to unlock Gen Z. What's the name so of your book, Hannah? It is a, a leader's guide to unlocking Gen Z. And I actually just got my That's first awesome. physical copy in the mail. So I'm so excited. Um, but it is it is truly a leader's guide to unlocking the, the next generation. And so what's interesting, dear John, this will wrap up my story, is that for this year, specifically since I've launched my own business and consulting practice, I've had the opportunity to work with some incredibly forward-thinking leaders in healthcare, in finance, in hospitality, to help them unlock the potential of Gen Z and learn how to attract us, Mm -hmm. how to recruit us, and then even more importantly, I think, retain and engage us because this is the future of work and I'm getting to help leaders overcome the misnomers and unlock our potential and our power while also building bridges between the generations. And that's, that's what gets me up in the morning. That's what I'm passionate about. Well, first of all, your journey is amazing. There's a lot to unpack here. I just want to go all the way back to something that you said about your, your dad, when he threw you his cell phone that you trusted him. Well, he trusted you and that builds the best kind of empowering relationship. So I thought that was awesome. Everything that you've said is so spot on. And it's really interesting about when you were sitting at the bar and they were talking about millennials, there's a lot of work that needs to be done to understand each generation. And what's interesting is that there you were Gen Z, they were talking about millennials Millennials, uh, a large portion of the workplace. However, Gen Z is going to be 27% of the workplace by 2025. And the work that you're doing is so important, Hannah, because not being able to unlock the talent, not being able to retain and to attract, that's going to be a big issue for these companies. So I'm going to ask this super important question. Can you share what is it that Gen Z, from your experience as a Gen Zer, what are they looking for? How should a company 
be attracting them and recruiting them? What are the right steps? Absolutely. This is such a big question, <laughs> Deirdre. And as you can imagine, we, we could have multiple hour-long conversations delving into each of the specific areas. But for anyone who's listening, I want to get really practical with some things about what Gen Z is seeking out of the workplace first, and then some tactics that we really need to understand about Gen Z that are different from millennials. Because here's where a lot of the rub comes in is millennial leaders are going to be the managers of Gen Z in mm -hmm. many respects. So it's really important for millennials in particular to understand what makes Gen Z tick. How, you know, how is the recruiting method to reach Gen Z going to look vastly different from what millennials did when they first came into work? And um, actually, Deirdre, I have a very good friend who is a millennial, and we have these conversations all the time. She is the founder of a, a wonderful startup, and they work with students to connect students with mentors. And she and I were actually having this conversation just the other day about what is the purpose of advertising, for example, for right. careers when it comes to mm -hmm. Gen Z. So you think about the stereotype that Gen Zers are given all the time. What is it? You know, it's usually that they're always on their phones, you know, oh, those, those you know, kids yeah. who are always yeah. sitting around a table, they're never talking to each other, they're sitting on the couch with their cell phone, and they don't even look up. And while that's true, sure, Gen Z is on our phones all the time because it's almost like an extension of our limbs. In, in a sense. <laughs> it's always within three feet of your body. That's what I mean. Exactly. <laughs> it has to be. We, we're, we're so unsettled without them. Um, and that could be a whole different conversation. But to this point, you know, you think about the stereotypes of Gen Z and usually it's that image of the phone digital world. And what's interesting about having this conversation with my 30 year old millennial friend is she asked me, you know, hey, Hannah, what's what's your opinion of this new ad that my company is putting out to reach Gen Zers, you know, on Instagram or TikTok with the careers? And I looked at it and I said, I'd swipe straight through that on my story. I, I wouldn't even look at it because I'm not looking at social media for my jobs. Right. And this is extremely counterintuitive to most leaders and recruiters that I speak with. They think it's, it's obvious that Gen Z is looking at social media for our jobs when in actuality, what the data says is that 62% of Gen Z goes to friends and family for our jobs. Hmm. So, I, I mean, it I see like like a look on your generation, actually, yeah. it sounds like something that a Gen X would do, or even a, a boomer, you rely on friends and family. Exactly. I mean, they say that millennials very much on social media go to their online peers, and, and maybe that could be of Gen Z as well. But that's super interesting. Yes. And, and what's even more interesting is that when you compare this to millennials, what you see in the data is that Generation Z, even though we are native digitals and we could have an entire conversation about the importance of, of technology and digitization to Gen Z, what has happened is because technology has become such an extension of who we are and an extension of our limbs and we don't know how to function without it, we actually crave physical connection and in-person connection. So what the data is saying about recruitment specifically is that as opposed to millennials, over 50% of Gen Z goes to hiring events. They're wanting to go to physical in-person hiring events. They want to meet their potential employers. And, and, and for those of us who go to a four-year school, 59% are going to career centers. They're going to physical in-person career centers with their school or with employers who offer career centers to speak with a mentor or a counselor or a coach. And if you compare that to millennials, millennials were saying between nine and 11% of them were going to similar type hiring events. So that's a massive, massive. difference. That is such a big difference. So is there, is there shock when you share this with some of the leaders of different companies? I mean, especially Absolutely. the fact that they want to advertise on TikTok and Instagram, and that's not something that Gen Z would even want, expect, or, or care for on their platforms. Well, what are the reactions? And, and how do you tell them what are some of the ways that they can 
get Gen Z to come into their companies and and stay. That's the most important thing. So this is a very interesting mental shift that we need to talk about. So we just talked about how ads don't work, but Gen Z is on social media all the time. So what I generally tell companies, and because I do receive this, these looks of shock, like, you, you know, are you kidding me? We spent, we spent $5 million on career advertising oh, last year. Or, to not right. work, to not it's, get it's the return. Huge. So what I typically share with leaders is stop advertising, start influencing. And here's a difference. When Gen Z is on social media, 70 at least 70% of us, the data kind of fluctuates, but at least 70% of us are looking at social media as our primary source of entertainment. That's how we, that's how we get our entertainment after a long day of work or school. So when we see someone naturally engaging on that platform, whether it's TikTok, Instagram, YouTube, when we see them naturally engaging and showing us interesting content about a day in the life at a company, that is entertaining and it subconsciously causes us to want to work for the firm. So here's a practical tip that I give any leader or recruiter is if your company is currently advertising and you're spending thousands or hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars on ads, what you may be missing is the power of organic influence. You think about startups, for example, that don't really have a budget to create vanity ads, right? They can't spend $100,000 on one video campaign. They've started creating bootstrapped content that's extremely tangible, right? You look at TikTok, you look at companies like Barstool, for example, where their founder had no budget. So he started creating humorous videos that he posts on Instagram and YouTube. So What we need as as corporate America, from from their perspective, if they're going to reach Gen Zers, one practical tip is to hire career influencers. So what I mean by this is most companies already have a Gen Z employee, at least one, you know, already have a Gen Zer or a student or maybe an intern. And that Gen Zer, likely, if you go on their social media, maybe Instagram is is probably the easiest, most low-hanging fruit. You go on their Instagram and you'll see maybe they have 400, 500, 1,000 followers. You know, they're a small micro influencer in their local community. What if you could pay them an additional $5,000, $10,000? Maybe it's just a gift card every month to post consistent content about what a day in the life is like at your company. And what I don't mean by this, because I I hear some marketers out there when when I've told this before going, oh gosh, no, they can't do that. They're going to compromise the brand or, you know, they're, they're going to be outside of guidelines. What I mean by career influencing is that you need, if you want to do this intentionally to have someone from your marketing team involved, have someone from your HR team involved and help that Zier strategize what that content could look like, but let them have a huge voice because it's their platform in what they say and talk about. So what you're accomplishing with this career influencing is number one, you are showing Gen Zers who are looking at this particular person on their Instagram. You're showing them that a referral in their network is excited to work for your company. Number two, you are generating authentic connection with your brand that cannot be achieved through vanity ads. Right. So this Gen Zer is not only going to talk about the great things about work, they're also going to talk about the days when they were so tired they couldn't do anything, when there was a challenge that a leader helped them overcome. Gen Z is looking for authenticity. Yeah, so this is all clear. genuine. Yeah, it, genuine, unpolished content. Mm-hmm. So if the, if the Zers in their network, because remember all those Zers, 62% of them are looking to friends and family for referrals. So if they're scrolling through their feed and they're seeing consistent content from this one person talking about a day in the life of the company, you have got a powerful referral network you're going to generate from one Zer at a low cost with content that better connects and is so much less expensive than anything else you're going to create. You've created a power influencer. So that is, and and I know there's a lot to unpack there in tactics and whatnot, but if I could give one tip to recruiting Gen Z, just even getting in front of us, it would be to nix your ads and start influencing. 
No, that's a really good tip. I think it also speaks to the company and the ability to experiment, to try new ways. And Absolutely. that's what you have to do with different generations. The way you're using your advertising campaigns for millennials, or even if when you were advertising for Gen X, it's not going to work. And I think what you said about tapping into their peer network with genuine, authentic, showing who they are and life behind the scenes, that is so powerful. So I, I appreciate that tip. And I know that people who are watching Women Worldwide right now or, or tuning in, they're saying, you know what, Let, let's think about <laughs> changing the marketing advertising program. So Hannah, I, I want to ask you one quick question, which maybe you could share a, a powerful moment that you experienced, uh, maybe an aha or an uh-oh moment, other than when your dad handed you the phone when you were 12 years old. Maybe just give a, a quick moment that stuck with you, that really taught you something, one of those learning moments. Mm. Oh, gosh, there are so many in my life. But I can pinpoint one day, and this, this goes back to the power of a mentor. I was, I guess this was about three years ago, and I was in a slump. You know, I had graduated college really early and, you know, being an, an overachiever in a lot of ways, I, all of my mentors, friends, et cetera, I hear the day old, you know, oh, you're so mature for your age or you're doing everything ahead. And I started to feel like, you know what, maybe I need to slow down. You know, maybe I, I need to figure out what it's like to be normal in a sense, if you could even say normal. Sure. So this was back when I was 18, 19, et cetera. And I, I fell into this slump of, mm -hmm. you know, watching Netflix, not really focusing on goals, not really looking at, you know, what there was in life. I just kind of slumped. And one day, you know, I, I, I'd still go around, I guess, with my friends and say, you know, I, I have this, this dream and this vision of being able to help companies and speak on big stages. And I would tell them this dream. And one day, you know, I was sitting with a, with a wonderful mentor of mine and we're having coffee and I was trying a, a budak for the first time, the, the Bulgarian pastry that is just, oh, so Ooh. good. Uh, <laughs> if you haven't tried one, they're amazing. But this I is a good moment. The, what's it called? It's called a burek. It's B-U-R-E-K. And it's a, it's a croissant filled with meat. And oh, then you like wow. meat and cheese, you tear it apart. It's, it's fantastic. Um, but I, I was having this for the first time, which is probably why I remember this moment so well. And we're sitting there. And instead of her typically giving me the, oh, yeah, you're going to do great things, nod your head sort of, sort of conversation. Instead, she said, you know, Hannah, you're talking a lot about what you want to do, but I'm not really seeing any action. So what would you have to give up mm -hmm. in order to achieve the dream you pretend that you have? And I said, I pretend, no, this is my dream. You know, I, <laughs> this is what I want to do. And then it hit me that she was really talking about pretending because I was pretending, you know, I was saying, this is what I want to do, but I wasn't backing it up with action. So I, I share that with, with many women, especially to say, you know what, there are times that we need to be courageous mm -hmm. and call so out the things we see in people because it makes a difference in the trajectory of their lives. And so often we, you know, step back and, you know, as I shared at the beginning, I'm the oldest of seven kids and my tendency with my younger siblings who are all the way from ages 22 down to six. And I sometimes have this tendency to be, you know, um, to give them encouragement and, and forget to point out the things that I see in them that could be, you know, improved or, or things that, that could help them have more courage. So that was a good reminder to me. And it's state, it stuck with me. It's the reason I'm here, but it stuck with me for the past four years. And I'm so grateful to her for being courageous and, and, and sharing that with me. Well, thank you for sharing that moment. That, that is a special moment and powerful too, because at that moment, you were being true to yourself. When you start actioning that dream, then you're truly true to yourself. And any feeling that you had before, maybe around, am I moving too fast? Or that wasn't you. <laughs> Clearly, you wanted to pursue that dream. And, and you did, and you did it really well. So here's a question. I, I know you've shared a lot. I can't even believe we're at that point in the show where I ask you your parting advice 
for the Women Worldwide Network. If you could just sum it up, Hannah, what do you want to share about Gen Z, building relationships, working with them? Yes, there, there is so much that we can unpack. And that's actually the reason that I wrote the book that I just did talking about what are the practical ways that millennial leaders, Gen X leaders, and boomers can connect with Gen Z and, and communicate with us effectively? And I would say that the first step, Deirdre, for anybody listening, is as with anything, as with, as with empathy in the first place, the first step is to try to get into the shoes or get behind the lenses of your Gen Zers, whether it's your kids, your friends, your grandkids, whoever in your life is a Gen Zer or a good example of one, step into their shoes and see if you can think from their perspective, because that's going to be the first step to building bridges with Gen Z and being able to connect with us at work. Everything that we have seen from teenagers and what has influenced us from technology to social media to this new digital world where there's new realities in video games and, and new realities that, that, that Gen Z as native digitals lives within, all of those things are not just going to stay stuck in the teenage years. They're mm -hmm. going to pass on to the workplace. Gen Z is bringing those things into work. So I urge anyone, especially if you're a millennial leader and you're listening, you're going to be able to pave the way for Gen Z in such a powerful way. And we're looking to you to be our mentors and our guides because we know we're going to have a lot of frustration, perhaps, with getting past the uh, what I call the sacred corporate ladder. I think of mm -hmm. if you have you seen the show Loki, Deirdre, like the recent Loki show. So we started watching the series but uh -huh. didn't, didn't finish it, but yes. So I know. Okay. Yeah. So you know what the sacred timeline is? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Yeah. So that moment where, where Loki goes into the timekeeper's realm, right. And he, and he doesn't know where he is and he looks up on the screen. It's like a TSA advertisement, but it's yes. the timekeepers and it has, you know, the sacred timeline and everyone's supposed to be doing, you know, starting in one place and all of humanity and all of time is supposed to be following this one trajectory right. as a path. Then, <laughs> yes. As a path. And of course we all know, even if you haven't finished the show that the plot is going to be surrounded by, or, you know, filled by the variants who decide to branch off that timeline. And that's how I think about Gen Z is we're, we're being told right now, even as, as students coming into work, that we're supposed to follow the sacred corporate ladder, that we're supposed to climb one rung after another. And sometimes we might hop off and get on another ladder, but that is the way we're told that life is supposed to be. And instead, my generation is saying, we're not doing that. We're going to create a jungle gym instead. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Right. So we start creating a jungle gym. We want to play a little bit on the monkey bars. We want to play a little bit over on the slides. We, we want to go all the way around, get different experiences. So if you're a millennial leader listening to this, you probably resonate with a lot of what I'm describing about Gen Z, but Gen Z is taking this to a new level. And we need not only support and encouragement in making those different choices, but we also need someone to navigate and hold our hands as mentors to say, you know what? You can have that jungle gym, but let me show you here in our company how we can make progress toward a better future together with that, that, that natural gift that you have of focusing on efficient, efficiency and innovation. Um, so that would, would be the word that I would leave any millennial leader listening to this with is that with those images, maybe it's the Loki sacred timeline, sacred ladder, or whether it's you know the image of anything I've shared today, if you need language to help speak to the older leaders in your organization about the power of the next generation, maybe some of that will help you communicate how very different this generation is and how we exhibit some old-fashioned habits in a lot of senses, but are also bringing on a new frontier into the workplace of digitization and innovation. And so I hope that's encouraging to many people listening and that you'll be able to follow some of the practical steps um, and, and make the workplace better for everybody. Well, I think it's very encouraging. I hope that people watching and listening check out your book and you. So tell us, Hannah, where can people find out more about you and your work and your new book? <laughs> 
Yes. So I actually, I created a, a unique landing page for anyone listening to this. Um, you can just go to my website. It's Hannah G williams.com forward slash women worldwide. Awesome. If you go Thank there, you. I actually, uh, dear Jared, this may be interesting to you too. Uh, many leaders listen to this information. They think, oh my gosh, where do I start? You know, <laughs> there's so many things that we could talk about or that we could do as a company. I actually developed a pulse check. It takes three to five minutes to complete. And you can go on there, take the pulse check and see what you're already doing well in and where you might need to shift your strategy to better attract, recruit, and retain Gen Z. Awesome. We want to put this information on the show notes page. So we'll make sure that it gets there. So anybody who finds this show can access the link to your site and any of your great resources, as well as your book. So Hannah, thank you so much for coming on the show, for enlightening us about Gen Z, how to recruit and work with them and to leverage that talent. I really appreciate your time and insights. Absolutely. Thank you, Deirdre, for having me. You're welcome. And thank you to everyone who tuned in today. And until our next episode, friends, stay focused, energized, and feeling empowered. Thank you.